Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed speakers and guests. Welcome to today's debate. My name is Katja Gatschak. I'm the executive director of the Center for European Perspective, and I will moderate the discussion today. It is our great pleasure to partner with the Euro-Atlantic Council of Slovenia and the Politics and Society Institute in Jordan uh, in organizing today's roundtable on the topic of radicalization and violent extremism. Now, first off, and most importantly, it is a great pleasure to welcome our distinguished panelists. Dr. Mohamed Abu Rahman, uh, associate expert and writer on political Islam and violent extremism at the Politics and Society Institute in Jordan. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Florian Chekhaya, chair of the board at the Kosovar Center for Security Studies. Uh, welcome. And Dr. Istok Prezer, uh, president of the Euro-Atlantic Council of Slovenia and vice dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Ljubljana. So thank you for being here with us and for taking the time. Uh, before we dive in, I'd like to encourage the participants to submit your questions uh, on chat. And in the hour that we have together, we would also like to address your questions to this very important topic. Now, um, violent extremism is a threat that knows no borders. Uh, since we're here today from representing three different countries and kind of three different regions. And as we will um, basically discover, I believe it shows that the uh, vulnerability of all of our societies to the challenges of intolerance, hatred, and fear. Because of its global dimension, uh, I think the phenomenon of radicalization leading to violence poses a threat to the security and fundamental rights of citizens of all of our societies. Uh, we also, I think, have to note that no person is actually born a violent extremism. Person is made such um, by, and is taught to hate and promote division and fear. And so, I believe it shows that the age old human characteristic, uh, which is unfortunate between us that divide and rule, you know, kind of uh, division between us and them and, and uh, uh, that all the fear and misunderstanding that flows from that. Uh, so there's also no single cause to the rise of violent extremism or a single tra trajectory that actually leads someone to become a violent extremist. And therefore it's a complex interplay of so many factors. And so today we're joined by really excellent panelists to discuss uh, all of these topics and more closely examine the threat of radicalization and violent extremism in Jordan, in Kosovo and in Slovenia, and also the wider regions uh, and to explore the ideas of how to deal with this. Uh, we're gonna start off by giving each of our panelists a 10 minute uh, time slot to present uh, their, uh, their views. And then we can continue with the discussion. So Dr. Mohammed, uh, would you kindly take the floor? Thank you very much, uh, Katia. It's my pleasure to, to participate uh, in this, uh, I think, important uh, round table with uh, distinguished uh, panelists, uh, colleagues from other think tanks. Uh, actually, to talk about uh, the uh, challenge of uh, uh, radicalization and uh, terrorism to, uh, in Jordan in 10 minutes, it's very difficult. But I'm trying to, to give remarks, uh, uh, major remarks, and then we, maybe we can talk uh, in, in some of the details later. Uh, the challenge in Jordan, it's, it became uh, a very dangerous uh, since the rise of ISIS uh, in 2014. There are uh, several turning points of uh, the challenge of radical radicalization and terrorism. Um, since 1990, the returnees of Afghanistan, then the rise of a very uh, dangerous guy, his name is Abu Muhammad al-Maqdisi in the middle of the 90 decade. After that, the war of, in Iraq also, uh, it was a turning point of the uh, history of uh, challenge of radicalization, but the most important point which designed the current situation of the challenge of radicalization and terrorism it's the rise of ISIS after the situation in Syria, the war in Syria or the revolution in Syria in 2011. The rise of ISIS, the declaration of Khilafah in 2014, it was a very, very uh, important turning point of the uh, radicalization in, uh, in Jordan. Um, after that, with, uh, uh, in, in Jordan, we witnessed a, a very important changes happening um, thousands of people uh, went out of country, joined the armed group in Syria and Iraq. Uh, hundreds of them killed there and hundreds of them declared or uh, became like loyal 
to this new organization, uh, I mean ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And we witnessed, in, especially in 2000, 2016, very dangerous uh, uh, events in Jordan, terrorist attacks uh, on the borders and also in several cities in Jordan, Erbit, Assault, and other cities in Jordan. <clears throat> so we realized here that it is like rising uh, dangerous phenomena in, in, in the Jordanian society. Um, what, what happened after the rise of ISIS? Of course, we mentioned before that uh, thousands of Jordanians left Jordan to join uh, ISIS and al Nusra in Iraq and in Syria. But in Jordanian society, there was a very dangerous changes happened. This changes we noted in, in a, a study we published in the Center for Strategics and Studies uh, uh, in University of Jordan. This study, including 800 of the cases of Jordanian jihadists. So what is the important changes, and maybe we can compare with other countries like my colleagues, that we move from the phenomena of that the male uh, uh, individual males, uh, people who uh, uh, are participating in army group to the family type or pattern. So we now in Jordan, we don't talk about only that there are individuals, male individuals, they leave Jordan and go to join the army groups or uh, adopting this ideology. We talk about the family pattern. So we talk about uh, so social relationships. We talk about females began to, uh, to, to adopt this ideology and uh, the security court in Jordan, which charged the uh, uh, terrorist uh, cases. Now uh, there are tens of females uh, charged by, because that they have, uh, they adopting the ideology of ISIS. Also there are teen teenagers become like uh, uh, believe in this ideology. So this is what I mean. We, we move from the pattern of uh, males, individuals, to patterns of families. Now uh, we talk about hundreds of people uh, charged uh, uh, in the prison because that they believe in uh, the ideology of ISIS. Maybe they promoting the ISIS ideology in the social media or they joined and returned back from the uh, uh, terrorist groups in Syria and Iraq, or they tried to do uh, uh, terrorist attacks in Jordan by establishing secret groups which adopted ISIS uh, phenomena. In Jordanian situation, the uh, jihadist Salafist group divided in two groups. The first uh, supporting Al-Qaeda, believe in Al-Qaeda ideology, and the second which uh, present the majority today, especially from the youth. In, the, in these groups, they believe in ISIS ideology, which is more extreme or extremer than the Al-Qaeda ideology. So that this is a, 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 a new stage in the record of the jihad itself in Jordan. Uh, social char characters of the group changed also. In our uh, uh, quanti quantitative study, we discovered that the, they become, they have, they began to have, uh, to gain existence in the middle class, in the educated people, in the females, and in the new areas in Jordan. So that it's not like poverty, unemployment, uh, only economic conditions, no. Today we talk about people, they have higher education in Jordan. Some of them having PhD, in, in some of the science, others they are uh, professors in pharmacy, for example, others uh, professors in uh, religion. So we, uh, we are not talking about people not educated or people suffering from unemployment. For example, in this statistic, we have 8% teachers in the schools. They leave their schools and they went to join ISIS at Al Nusra in, in Syria. So, and also we have uh, 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 engineers, we have uh, university students. So the social character changed after the rise of ISIS. The third point, and I'm, I, I hope that I'm not uh, uh, taking um, our time. The third point, 
uh, an important character of the Salafist jihadists in Jordan that Jordan became like exporting the leaders of uh, extremism and terrorism. And uh, uh, especially the people who work in the theory of the jihadist uh, 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 ideology. Uh, giving an example, the, one of the important guys is them is Abu Muhammad al Maqdisi. Abu Muhammad al Maqdisi considered to be the spiritual leader or father of the, the ideology of the Al Qaeda. Abu Muhammad al Maqdisi now based in Jordan. Uh, Abu Qatad al Palestini, he, uh, he also considered to be a very dangerous guy in uh, uh, establishing the ideology of Al Qaeda. Abu Musab al Zarqawi, the, the founder of ISIS, he also is Jordanian. Hundreds of the leaders in Al Nusra and today Hurras al Din in Syria, they are Jordanians. So we talk about a, a, a Jordanian participation not only in Jordanian situation, but all over the world. And this is a very important uh, or dangerous phenomenon. Maybe we can talk about it later. I will stop here because there are many points, Katia, but maybe in, in other uh, places we can. Uh, uh, spot, put spotlights and other uh, topics. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mohammed. This is really fascinating. I think I would let you speak for another hour, but um, we can touch on other points uh, a bit later. I will hand it over uh, to Florian. Uh, Dr. Florian Chahaya, could you please take the floor and give you 10 minutes as well, present the situation from the point of view of Kosovo, and then we can connect uh, the dots, so to speak. Yeah. Thank you, Katya. It's my great pleasure to, to speak in front of uh, your audience and uh, um, I will uh, certainly uh, speak from the Kosovo perspective, but uh, from rather a slightly different uh, angle of what Dr. Mohammed uh, said, I will speak about, uh, about the context here uh, and in our surrounding, but in particular about the returnees uh, from, um, uh, from the foreign conflicts in, in Syria and Iraq. Uh, my PowerPoint presentation is being uh, mastered by uh, one of the uh, colleagues from CEP. Uh, I hope that should work. If not, I can just continue like this. Okay. Uh, so you can immediately move to the uh, first slide um, because I want to briefly mention about what we, uh, um, what we do as an organization. Can you move to the first slide, please? Okay, so uh, Kosovo Center for Security Studies is an independent think tank based in Pristina in Kosovo. Uh, we have been dealing extensively with, with the broader issues of uh, security, uh, security sector uh, in Kosovo, but since 2014, we have been heavily involved in studying um, uh, the uh, countering violent extremism and terrorism, uh, not only in Kosovo, but also in neighboring Albania and North Macedonia. We were the first uh, think tank to come up with the uh, landmark, landmark report on the uh, um, individuals that uh, went to fight in, in foreign conflicts in Syria and Iraq. And uh, up to now, we have managed to uh, conduct uh, around 15 studies in the broader field of uh, countering violent extremism. Uh, in addition to that, we were, let's say, lucky enough to contribute in, the, in different policy processes in developing strategies related to countering violent extremism, anti-terrorism, and other uh, strategies and concretely uh, on, on this case we are recently implementing a major uh, project on the uh, uh, increasing resilience and the uh, uh, returned uh, families and individuals uh, from uh, Syria and Iraq. Next slide please. So uh, just quickly figures uh, for, for Kosovo, we have an estimated 403 Kosovans that joined uh, foreign terrorist, uh, just joined uh, conflicts in, in Syria and Iraq between 2012 and uh, 2018. This is the total number. Uh, so uh, by no means this uh, marks 403 combatants, but we are speaking about 403 individuals in total, including kids that have been even uh, born there. Um, out of those uh, 255, so are considered to be foreign terrorist fighters, so people that had uh, combat uh, uh, readiness. Um, we have uh, 242 uh, out of this number that have returned through a special 
operation conducted by the Minister of Internal Affairs and Minister of Justice. So they have been returned through a, a partnership with, with Turkey. Uh, this was a very complicated and complex operation to return uh, such a large number of, of, of people. Um, uh, and uh, most of those were uh, uh, women and, and kids. And we have about uh, 100 Kosovos that, 100 Kosovos that were killed in, in Syria and Iraq. Next, next slide, please. Uh, so speaking generally about, uh, about uh, some general thoughts about uh, uh, the work in, in countering violent extremism. Uh, Kosovo has made huge progress in countering violent extremism. Um, one of the reasons for, for this was that there was a, a strong uh, societal cohesion uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of dealing with this. So there was no caveats, political caveats on how to deal with, the, with, with this topic. And there was a strong political willingness on top, on top of everything. We, we concluded from our studies that also the strong national identity component that is present uh, among the Kosovans in one side, and on the other side, uh, more information and more knowledge among people and citizens on how to deal with this topic uh, has made uh, uh, the progress uh, visible. Of course, the progress was not only related to, to the work that has been done in Kosovo, but also to the uh, diminishing role of terrorist formation, ISIS and others. And of course, the uh, failure of ISIS to uh, capture territory, as it was the case a few years ago. Uh, we found out that there was lots of uh, problems at the beginning because people had no clue how to deal with this matter. So there were lots of awareness raising campaigns of how to inform the parents of the kids on dealing and transmitting the messages. At the beginning, it was a, a total uh, mess. Um, at the, from our initial findings back in 2015, we have identified uh, especially a so-called takfiri ideology that was very dangerous and was penetrating a lot um, uh, certain individuals and groups uh, in Kosovo. Uh, and some of them have managed to uh, become um, uh, prone to uh, radical ideas. And out of those, some of them uh, were also uh, uh, people that would potentially use uh, force and violence uh, for uh, reaching certain goals. Unfortunately, we have some of the uh, notorious uh, uh, terrorists that uh, were quite present uh, in, in Syria and Iraq. We were fortunate enough not to have uh, not even a single incident of terrorism in, in Kosovo or in or in the or near surrounding. Here, there was an attempt in 2016 to attack Israeli football team, which was successfully prevented by the intelligence uh, st uh, structures. And we keep referring to this because it was, uh, it was really a successful story of preventing or preempting uh, uh, potential terrorist incidents. Um, there was certain uh, problems in terms of dealing with, it, with this uh, type of uh, extremism, which has to do with uh, or has to do with Islam or misuses Islam uh, for certain purposes. But we also see growing uh, elements of right-wing extremism uh, in the country and nationalism, which doesn't have to do with the type of extremism that we are referring to. And on top of this, we have extensive disinformation campaign, which is damaging, and it tends to overrate uh, or exaggerate the level of extremism and radicalization. So there is a discrepancy between the information that we see and uh, and the uh, actual practice when it comes to the extent of extremism, because we think that there is a very limited group of individuals that are subject to this. Uh, we can't quantify it in percentage, but we are talking for a number of hundreds of people that were subject to uh, radical ideas. And uh, this number is shrinking, though it's, it's not diminished uh, at all. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, now I want to share uh, with your audience some of the um, findings on how Kosovo dealt with uh, repatriated Kosovans from, from, Syria, uh, from Syria. We have a, a, a well-regulated uh, framework in terms of dealing with uh, those that uh, went to uh, fight in foreign conflicts, not only in Syria and Iraq, it could be other conflicts that may come. Um, we have, uh, there is a strong facility for transitional support uh, near Pristina, where those that have been repatriated, those over 200 are uh, placed there, some of them, some are uh, back in the families. There is uh, uh, some sort of reintegration support, so because there was a greater need for dealing with those that have returned. Uh, and 
the, the main striking uh, elements that we uh, were advocating and I think now is, is finally working is there are some efforts for de radical for disengagement, I would rather say, for disengagement uh, of certain individuals that are radicalized and they are in prisons. Next slide, please. So uh, in this graph, you can see uh, the rehabilitation measures that we uh, deal in Kosovo when it comes to uh, basically those that have repatriated. Um, uh, basically, there is a, a classic repatriation approach. Uh, there is a, a, an institutional unit in the Ministry of Internal Affairs that solely deal with the issue of those that are repatriated. There is a mental health component that was a strong need for, for dealing with this. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, of course, incentives, socioeconomic uh, incentives and support upon return. We, are, we keep mentioning this because there was an extensive stigmatization uh, of those that have returned. They have been alienated and we had the fear that uh, this could backfire uh, and uh, this stigmatization could uh, eventually erupt into some sort of uh, uh, backfiring from people and the kids that would eventually grow up coming from the families that returned from, uh, from, from foreign conflicts. Uh, comparing to Jordan, which uh, shares the border with, uh, with um, Syria and Iraq and where the, the, the threat was more imminent, we thought that in our case we had this lack of uh, we had this uh, let's say uh, lack of of controlling the borders and dealing with with the people that have been repatriated let's say more systematically uh, and of course uh, thanks to the uh, cooperation that goes on between certain uh, countries and exchange of information the next slide please and uh, uh, this is uh, the punitive measures. Of course, we are not talking about uh, rehabilitation of reintegration of all members uh, for uh, everyone that has been part of, uh, um, uh, of foreign conflicts and that um, uh, was, let's say, of the ability to do uh, combat operations, if I can use it in this language. Uh, there was there was clear there is a clear uh, uh, provision in the law saying that everyone shall be sentenced within with imprisonment imprisonment from five to fifteen years, and there was no uh, let's say selective approach whatsoever on any of the cases. So all of those that have returned and there were evidence more or less that they have been in the combat operation, uh, other than the kids and most of the wives, uh, they have been subject to. Uh, uh, sentence and they were, went to the to the uh, trial. There was, of course, um, uh, there was, um, of course, it was not only the recruitment uh, part and the participation part. It was also the the the, the, the fact that if you were funding uh, uh, terrorist formations or uh, any of the activities, then you were also subject to uh, punitive uh, measures, or if you encouraged others to do uh, so. Uh, and I think this is uh, it from my side. Maybe I have a last slide to share with you, if you can. Okay, so uh, lastly, uh, there is um, um, the challenges that we face is that uh, I believe that was the case with Jordan. Uh, the case with Kosovo was that we were flooded with extensive support from the donors. And uh, this support was not necessarily, let's say, coordinated by the actors. You would have a crowded approach suddenly donors shifting uh, their policies because there was more money coming and shipping in when it comes to this topic. And this was not necessarily productive. It was counterproductive at some point, but lately they were trying to be more synchronized. And we thought that this was a lesson learned that, uh, that there needs to be a more synchronized approach from the donors to give a systematic priority to the topics. Because at the end of the day, this is a huge challenge to our society, but it's not the main challenge. And somehow there was a, uh, a tendency to trigger more attention towards this topic because there was more uh, money coming in. Of course, there was some concrete programs that have been developed for the purpose of preventing uh, violent extremism. Uh, I stop here because I, I'm running. I already You're almost a bit over time. time. <laughs> yeah, and lastly, there are basically uh, some pictures that we showed that how we dealt with the kids of the, those that were returned from from Syria and Iraq. Uh, um, it's a very sad story for many of those that uh, actually some uh, lost both parents, 
but we did our best as a think tank and organization to 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 deal with them and engage with them and it, we were not the only one uh, i stop here i look forward to any uh, question or comment on your side uh, thank you, Florian. That's a very interesting brief. Uh, we'll come back with a few questions, but before, uh, as um, on plan, uh, Istok, I would ask you for your remarks uh, regarding the situation in Slovenia. It's a country where, uh, quite honestly, we don't really have these debates very often. So uh, uh, it will be interesting to hear uh, what your study has come up with and um, how we should be not uh, disregarded as a country in that in that respect as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Katia, also on behalf of Euro-Atlantic Council of Slovenia. I have to say that I'm very glad that this uh, tripartite uh, event is taking place. Uh, uh, radicalization, especially in time of Corona, is an issue and continues to be an issue, and we need to talk about that. And uh, I think that this kind of event, co-organized by different organizers, is, is just uh, a, a great thing to have. Uh, I would like first to make a, a general point on this, and then I would uh, deal with Slovenia. Uh, my general point is that uh, when, 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 when COVID crisis started approximately one year ago, everybody expected, because of economic situation, because of lockdowns, that uh, terrorism globally and also terrorism in Europe will increase. But uh, looking backwards now, we see that this really hasn't happened. We don't have any major terrorist, event, terrorist events, uh, major terrorist attacks because of COVID or due to COVID. We have, however, many incidents and we have seen increased polarization in all our societies and also violent conflicts because of that, but not the, the, the pure terrorism has not really increased. And maybe uh, an explanation for this is uh, um, that there are two forces uh, at work right now. First force is, of course, the COVID crisis, which really has deepened uh, our existing cleavages and created new cleavages, especially between left and right. But on the other hand, COVID crisis is such a pressing crisis that literally it took some uh, wind out of the of the sails of uh, of, of other radicalisms. And uh, I believe that because of COVID, uh, uh, there are some people who would uh, likely do some bad things and they, they, they don't have time to deal with that. They, they have a COVID problem to deal with. So we have two forces uh, uh, at work at the same time. Uh, and this is my general point I just wanted to, to, to make uh, here. But then uh, coming to Slovenia, I would uh, first describe what we found in our research uh, about the uh, radicalization, Islamist radicalization and extremism in our country. And this is pretty much worrying. And at the end, I would also like to point out uh, the paramilitary military group, uh, right-wing paramilitary group, which was established in our country some years ago, which is also a very worrying um, uh, uh, problem. So coming back to Islamism and uh, Islamic Islamist radicalization, now, as you know, Slovenia never had a major, or even Slovenia never uh, faced a terrorist attack on its soil. Slovenia doesn't have a, uh, an operating active terrorist group against its government. And uh, basically we are a known case, but, uh, but uh, if I may say, we were overlooked also not only by experts, also by terrorists themselves, which is a good thing. But our research uh, for the period uh, uh, from 2000 to 2020 has shown that actually Slovenia, uh, uh, we, we found indicators uh, of broad spectrum of basic forms of terrorism, which is terrorist threats, foreign fighters, and uh, even an attempted attack, attack, and also indicators of supportive forms of radicalization, which is attempts of recruitment, uh, training, transfer of people, arms, and money. So basically, this known case uh, in my eyes, is actually a case, but a case without a uh, terrorist attack. And uh, in, during this time, these events, the events I will, I will tell you about, have, were never reported on the first pages of our newspapers. People still think that terrorism is not an issue. And, and uh, uh, our official uh, terrorism threat level was never raised above the minimal level. Uh, Slovenia should be perceived as a, as a, as a like a log logistical, place or a tampon zone between uh, sources of jihadist power in Vienna, in, uh, in Bosnia, and in North Italy. Uh, especially uh, many of our 
uh, radicals and jihadists and uh, foreign fighters have been uh, have been uh, uh, recruited by uh, uh, Bilal Bosnich, who is a preacher uh, from Bosnia Herzegovina and was also imprisoned for that. So let me come to my eight indicators to show you what happened in Slovenia. So Slovenia clearly in last 15 years has been a transit country for Islamists, uh, for their people, for weapons and funds. Uh, there were about five, according to my data, about five, six or seven persons uh, suspected terrorists were uh, arrested in our country on their way to Bosnia or on their way to, to, uh, to uh, Syria to fight for, for ISIS. Uh, we also have uh, um, two attackers uh, in 2015, uh, attackers in the Paris terrorist attack, who basically came uh, with the large influx of immigrants uh, through Slovenia, and they carried out uh, a major terrorist attack in Paris uh, in the same year. We also had a case of a former German soldier who was a convert and was moving with his wife in forests of Slovenia, uh, robbing places uh, and wanting to collect the money to get to Bosnia and to continue his uh, jihadist uh, uh, story. And also we have seen movements of weapons and explosives which were through Slovenia from the Western Balkans, which were used then in, certain, in some uh, terrorist attacks in, in Western Europe. In terms of foreign fighters, which is second indicator, we had only around 10 people who fought for ISIS or for uh, al-Nusra. They all went to, to, to Syria uh, through Turkey and they were most of them, they were recruited uh, through Bilal uh, Bosnich, the person already mentioned. So it was basically the Bosnian jihadist line which was recruiting Slovenians and sending Slovenians to, to, uh, to, to Syria. Um, uh, some of them died, some of them were sentenced here, some of them, like Rok Jaubi, was sentenced in Italy, because when he was a returnee, when he came back from Syria, uh, Bilal Bosnich instructed him to uh, re recruit and train new recruits. So uh, this recruit was used for training new recruits, and, uh, and, um, and he was sentenced for that uh, in Italy. The third indicator is NGOs, which promoted extremism. Now, this has not been, this was not done publicly in Slovenia. This was done behind the closed doors. Uh, there were some some NGOs like El Iman and Saruddin and uh, and uh, and uh, Nur Society, which invited certain foreign preachers to talk about uh, the, the the issues, uh, the problems in the world, and uh, obviously. Some of people who participated in these meetings or uh, even the, one of the organizers, they went to fight uh, to Syria. Uh, we had an interesting example when uh, unidentified uh, um, radicals uh, wanted to pay uh, money uh, to some Roma people. Uh, Roma is a minority in Slovenia, which is pretty much vulnerable due to their economic situation. So they were paid to radicalize and to, to become uh, converts. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, we think that this happened because of their, of their Slovenian passports. They could be a useful asset, uh, asset uh, uh, in terms of moving in the European Union. We also had uh, interesting threats uh, uh, to local authorities in the town of Velenje, where the mayor, uh, their mayor in years 2015 and 16, uh, was continuously receiving uh, uh, letters from Italy. Uh, uh, saying that uh, they will kill him if he doesn't build a mosque with 35 uh, meters uh, uh, high, uh, 35 meters high minaret, or, or and if he doesn't convert to Islam, there was also a picnic uh, which was portrayed by foreign media. A picnic, let's say, a family reunion of people from Austria, Slovenia, Bosnia, and Germany who were celebrating birthdays of their kids. But Austrian press uh, published, based obviously based on their in, uh, of that, based on the data of their intelligence services, published that this actually was just a cover for uh, ideological and uh, uh, military training, supposedly in the forests where they had picnic, which is actually quite close to Ljubljana. Uh, they there were weapons uh, stored there, and they had uh, they were uh, practicing shooting. Our police, when they were investigating, investigating this, they didn't find a clue about that, but uh, foreign intelligence, obviously, yes. Yeah, Istok, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you another minute or two, but then we're going to have yeah. to... Yeah, okay, I'm just finishing. Uh, so we also had a false terrorist attack in Ljubljana. A Croatian citizen, Loris Bodljeva, was arrested on the bus on his way from Croatia 
to Slovenia and they found a suicide belt uh, in his possession. Obviously, he wanted to target uh, some of the Slovenian, some of the foreign embassies in Slovenia or a parliament or a governmental building. building. So uh, or if, if I sum up, uh, accordingly, the Slovenian non-case, uh, uh, it, there is a story in Slovenian non-case, and if we if we don't take it, uh, if we don't pay attention to this kind of uh, weak links, uh, then the terrorists will sooner or later. Uh, for the conclusion, I would also like to say that we have seen some uh, right-wing radicalization. There was a small paramilitary group formed by an unsuccessful uh, politician, uh, 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 Shishko Andrei Shishko. Uh, they were marching uh, along the border, trying to prevent immigrants to enter. They were masked, they were uniformed, and they were wore weapons, sometimes, uh, most of the times, fake weapons. And uh, this has, um, it, it's pretty, dist pretty much disturbing for a country like Slovenia to have this kind of group uh, of people moving around and uh, claiming their demands and uh, uh, literally jumping, uh, literally trying to do uh, border protection instead of police and uh, armed forces. So, so much about Slovenia. There is uh, uh, still other things we can talk later, but this is it from my side. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Easter, that I had to interrupt, but th oh. time is ticking, and I think we have lots of uh, important topics uh, to get to. First, I want to give priority, as I promised, to the participants. We have a question from Tomash for Dr. Mohammed. Um, he says he spoke about families, young people, and pupils who are joining Islamist ideology and radical groups. Why do you think these radical groups are so attractive? Um, to those groups of people. So why? what are the main reasons uh, for the people to want to join them? And I would also then address the same question to Florian as well in, in the case of Kosovo. Why do you believe that these people were attracted? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Thomas, for, uh, Thomas, for this important question. Uh, my answer, uh, I will divide my answer in two, two, two points. The first point, um, if we talk about Jordan, Jordanian geopolitic situation is very important here. We talk about uh, borders, uh, Iraq in the east of Jordan, Syria in the north of Jordan, occupied territories in Palestine is west of Jordan, so that Jordan is in the middle of a crisis. And the war in Iraq 2003 uh, affected uh, very deeply in many youth in Jordan that they feel angry from what's happening in Iraq. After that, the situation in Syria, the, uh, what the media uh, uh, is present like tortured and the people suffering so that it mobilized the emotions of uh, hundreds of people. And these radical groups investing in these emotions and in these pictures so that they, can, they uh, 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 prepare the environment to them when they come to Syria to uh, hosting them and to recruit them uh, by their ideology and uh, by their propaganda. The second, uh, so that the Jordanian geopolitics situation, very important to understand the uh, jihadi phenomena of Jordan. The second point, it's the changes or the, uh, um, the leap which happened from, uh, I, uh, from Al Qaeda to ISIS. Al Qaeda in the past, not interested in the teenagers or women. The women defining by, uh, by the leaders of Al-Qaeda that it's the wife of the jihadists. ISIS defy the women, it's the jihadist herself. They consider the woman jihadist. So that we, we began to witness uh, thousands of women join the ISIS group and join the territory of, uh, uh, travel to the territory of ISIS. Of course, it reflects in Jordanian situation because Jordan is very uh, 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 close to, to, to Syria and Iraq. And also they uh, want to uh, follow their uh, husbands, their parents, other uh, people, so that this uh, phenomena began to spread to the women and to the uh, teenagers. And the, uh, another point in Jordanian case, it's the generations. Now we talk about the third generation of the jihadists in Jordan, if we consider the the beginning of the phenomenon in the 1990s. So today we, we talk about a guy who married another a woman. They have like kids, they raise their kids and their ideology. 
and some of the cases we we see that in the in the security court we see that there is a grandfather then his son and his grandson in other cases so we talk about a phenomena which has uh, uh, entered the generation um, uh, timeline here in in georgia if i may just follow up on that and i'm getting another question why the shift from poverty social groups and to middle class and educated people do you believe it has to do with this generational um continuation as well and to um kind of build on that do you see the radicalization trend in jordan do you see them evolve in terms of like an upward trajectory or do you see it in waves where you actually have a peak and then it goes down to a lower level again how, how do you see that um evolving so those two if i may <laughs> mm, uh... It's, uh, we, we have a new study today revisiting the, the field, uh, uh, another study after the collapse of the ISIS state. And uh, you know that ISIS is starting the, the virtual Khilafah today, after the collapse of the real Khilafah. Uh, the peak, it was after the rise of ISIS. Now we, we, we need to understand after the collapse of the real state, what is going on the field. Today we are, uh, I mean, when I say me, and my colleagues here in the Center for Strategic Studies, we have uh, other visiting to the field to see to meet the people who went out of the prison, released from, from the prison, to understand where is the phenomenon going. But uh, another indicator and a quick indicator here, uh, we thought, because I am uh, writing about this phenomenon uh, uh, since two decades, <laughs> What we uh, uh, thought after the, uh, the death of Azarqawi in 2006 that the phenomena went down in Jordan because the, uh, and the collapse of the, his group in, in Iraq after the Sahawat in Iraq. But we, uh, what we uh, discovered or figured out after that, that there are some period of times they become quiet, but it doesn't mean that they are not spreading. So if you don't see them in the media, and doing their work and uh, attacks, it doesn't mean that the phenomena is going down. It means maybe that there is re-establishing a new phase of this phenomena or uh, a, new, a new era. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, Florian, I will, if I can take it to you and actually pose a question. Um, when in, you talked a lot about actually uh, repatriating the foreign fighters, but you've, you didn't, you mentioned families as well, but you didn't mention, were these foreign fighters or people that were engaged abroad, were they mostly men or were they also women? Do you see the same phenomenon with people that you uh, have in Kosovo that also women are getting radicalized? Is that something that you saw? And secondly, uh, could you touch upon the regional perspective a little bit? Because I know you've done work in Macedonia and Albania as well. Yeah, so you can hear me, yeah. Uh, well, uh, on, on, on the first question, your you question was, can you repeat? Because I couldn't get the first question. Uh, did you see women uh, in yeah, this yeah, so, yeah. Uh, group? Of yeah. The... So, uh, well, uh, the women, radicalizing women is not uh, something uh, uh, new. It was from the time when we had women that, have, uh, that went to Syria on their own back in 2014, 15, 16. So, but it was to a much uh, lower uh, extent uh, comparing to, to the man. Um, actually, comparing to Jordan, because uh, Mohammed referred to families, here there was less potential of seeing entire families subject to radicalization. Those families, that were, there were very uh, few exceptions, few cases where uh, families went uh, and went subject to uh, violent extremism. We are talking more of an individuals that went to, let's say, I'm now tailoring it to more to Syria and Iraq. Went to Syria and Iraq, they got married there, uh, either with the women that went uh, to, to fight there, or they were married with, uh, with uh, uh, other women. Uh, it could be even in Turkey or, not, or other countries. And then they created their own uh, bubble, uh, family. Um, we have rare cases of families here in Kosovo, uh, that are the entire family subject to radicalization. We are talking more about individuals that were subject to this ideology. And here we comes more uh, close to uh, what Mohammed said, uh, which is the same pattern that we are not talking about people that were uh, 
uh, subject to poverty, poor people, uh, and so on. Uh, we have a number of uh, uh, factors or drivers that made young people subject to uh, radicalization. It could be individual factors uh, uh, and structural uh, factors. The individual factors could be uh, ego, personal ego, uh, problems with identity, uh, personal identity, or who am I, uh, then um, trauma from the families, you know, uh, people that had uh, certain skills for some reasons we could not identify why would people having IT, strong IT skills, uh, medical skills uh, being attracted by the radical groups. I think this is uh, a niche that we haven't covered that much. We have a couple, couple of those people that were subject to highly skilled uh, people. Uh, then structural could be, could be also these economic uh, prospects. Um, then uh, individuals coming from uh, uh, from remote parts uh, and so on and so forth. So w w the, the pattern haven't changed from the beginning, at least from speaking from our case. But generally speaking, uh, we have seen a decreased number of uh, those that were subject to to radicalization in the last years, which, as I said, is a combination of also the work that has been done, but also the collapse of uh, ISIS. I'm not saying that we run out of uh, extremists, uh, by far, no, but uh, these individuals are much more under control because we have a small territory and almost everyone knows each other. <laughs> and this was uh, uh, maybe a disad uh, disadvantage for one side, but an, an advantage was that, you know, like we have managed to locate all of the potential for extremists uh, uh, here. Um, regional approach, uh, I mean, it's, it's more or less the same picture. Uh, when we talk about North Macedonia, the situation was uh, very concerning in the beginning. We were warning that the main elements of radical uh, Islam was coming initially from Skopje, uh, from some imams. I think this has become much more under control recently in the beginning, or uh, uh, we were of some sort of... Uh, um, we, we came to some sort of a finding that uh, the previous government uh, was not very keen or interested to, uh, to deal with this topic for political reasons, because it wanted to keep this level of inter-ethnic, inter-religious tension more present among the Macedonian society. But this has changed with the new government, and there is much more emphasis on dealing with this topic. And there were serious efforts, especially in the last two, three years, to deal with this. Uh, whereas in Albania, I think there was uh, uh, lots of efforts uh, also there in dealing with this, and there was few, the first case of the repatriated individuals that uh, came from Syria and Iraq, uh, following the example of Kosovo, at least as they referred to. Uh, and I think um, because we are speaking for a context of Albanian-speaking individuals, uh, which uh, have managed some of them to operate very closely uh, despite the borders. Um, thank you, uh, Florian. We're getting in quite a few questions. First, I want to turn to Istok and actually we will answer all the questions. Thank you for submitting them. Uh, quickly, Istok, if you could um, address, uh, we are also a small country and we all know each other <laughs> by, by association, but it's still there seems to be cases of uh, things flowing underneath that we should be aware of and that you rightly pointed out. Um, how much of this uh, probably I'm assuming the majority was brought in from abroad and how much of this do you, do you believe is due to recruiting in person versus internet, uh, social media, um, the role that, that that plays in radicalization? In Slovenia, you mean, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so basically it's, it's, it's two things. First, uh, jihad ideology is a global, it's a global, how should I say, liquid. It's, it's ideology which works uh, across countries and it's distributed uh, over the internet, uh, darknet, uh, email, uh, in their publications which, which are published uh, uh, online. So uh, only some cases in Slovenian case were radicalized um, uh, as lone wolf, uh, wolves. Mm -hmm. As long wolves, uh, we we have for uh, I said we had approximately ten. We don't know exactly, but let's say we had ten foreign fighters. A few of them were radicalized uh, as long wolves, but mostly uh, these guys who were using internet in this respect, they came across somebody uh, in the NGOs I was talking about, or they went to Bosnia 
uh, I would assume also maybe to Kosovo or to Macedonia, and they have met people there. They have met people who were, you know, enlarging their uh, <laughs> views, who were stimulating their thinking, and who enabled them to uh, uh, to, to come uh, to travel to Turkey and to, uh, arrange uh, uh, their uh, arrange meeting there with the right people. You know, I mean, if you go to the war zone, it's quite clear that you just can't go. I mean, you can go to the war zone and the, the likelihood to be killed is quite high. You need to meet somebody there. So they provided the contact and uh, majority of Slovenian guys who went there, they were, uh, they they had this kind of contact. And as I said, uh, Bilal Bosnich, the, the, the preacher from Bosnia and Herzegovina, who was sentenced for that, uh, he, he did the job. Uh, there was also some other guy who was contacting Slovenians and uh, talking to them. And this is the way how it worked in Slovenia. So basically, I mean, you, you have to know that, uh, so basically the, this uh, uh, Wahhabism and uh, Salafism is more or less imported to our, to our country. As you know, we have a small uh, uh, Bosniak minority and all those uh, old Yugoslavs who were living here, they always have been moderate Muslims. So this came from abroad. Maybe the last trend I should mention here, and this this is now <laughs> Florian is from Kosovo. He knows this very well, and uh, and uh, uh, we have an increasing number of of uh, of uh, immigrants now from Kosovo, and uh, really the numbers are huge, and uh, um, uh, we are a little bit worried about uh, the level of their integration. Uh, you know, um, there are not in Ljubljana, but in other in other towns in Slovenia, like Velenje or like my town, Kran. Florian knows Kran very well. So we have we have so many Kosovars now that nobody knows where is this leading. Uh, you know, in the future, and uh, and um, uh, uh, I'm afraid that in the future we are also going to see uh, this Slovenian Kosovo radicalization link uh, much more alive than it used to be. In the past. Um, thank you. Maybe I will skip Florian's reaction to this right now because it might get us into other waters that we want to, but I really do want to address the questions that we're getting from the audience. Uh, Andre, hi Andre, thank you for your question. Uh, usually we say that women are the solution to the challenge of radicalization, but now it seems that they've increasingly part of the problem. How best to address this situation and how we can reach out to them? Um, Dr. Mohammed, you will probably take this one. Yes, of course, um, they are a part of uh, women. <laughs> they are part of the problem and part of solution, of course. Um, in the past, as we mentioned, the pattern of jihadism in, in, the, uh, in the world, um, just only uh, males, individuals, uh, adults. Today, we talk about families, so that women became a part of jihadism. Uh, in, in many uh, countries, and uh, we wrote a, a book with, with my colleague, uh, Hassan Abu Aniya. it's about uh, the women in ISIS, so that we talk about how is the transition happening from uh, Al-Qaeda to ISIS, uh, uh, in the role of the women in, in ISIS. But also the women, they are a very important part of the solution, because if, we, if our counter-radicalization uh, uh, program we can involve women and engage them in these programs, we can prevent uh, the phenomena and we can decrease uh, the people that they are engaged in these radical groups. In Jordan, there is another question, Katia. It's about the de-radicalization program in Jordan, I think I, I saw. Quick, quick remark, of course we have de-radicalization program in Jordan. We also have counter-terrorism uh, strategy in Jordan, counter-extremism strategy in Jordan. It, began, it starts focusing on the laws, uh, uh, legislations, so that we, we did amendments in the law of terrorism. Uh, uh, it includes that the people who are promoting uh, terrorism, they are today charged in the prison, the returnees people from the uh, armed group also. It's, uh, so that there are many amendments in the legislation. There is a program in the prison, but in my opinion, it's not a very active program. It still needs many, many uh, uh, points to be an active and effective program. They declared before uh, two weeks or three weeks that there are 45 people uh, convinced that they are wrong in the prison. They are extremists and they released out. Okay, but we need more and more and we need really in Jordan 
to rethink about our strategy of the uh, preventive strategy. How can we prevent people to become part of this group and the uh, uh, rehabilitation strategy? How can we deal with the people who are returnees from the prison? They are today, we talk about hundreds of people they put in the prison, after the prison, how you have to deal with these people. It's a very important point. Still, we don't have today in Jordan a program uh, after the prison to the people who released out of prison. So that uh, we have still many challenges in the question of radicalization, extremism, terrorism in Jordan. But to be uh, uh, frankly, Jordanian intelligence, they did a very, very strong role uh, recent years because they have a very hard work to, to deal with this regional challenge and internal challenge at the same time. How can you deal with people who want to, to do a, a terrorist attacks? It's not easy so that they uh, succeed to prevent tens of uh, attacks in Jordan not to happen in airports and in, in diplomatic uh, facilities in uh, hotels in, in many places they succeeded to, to, to prevent these attacks, but still we, we face a not easy challenge. Um, thank you. I will also get to another, and thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for also addressing the question uh, that was posed by Benjamin. And uh, I will take uh, the second question to Florian, uh, posed by Benjamin. Do you think that this information campaign is a part of a broader action against Kosovo, which is the most prominent source of it. Now, it might be a different, slightly different topic, but since uh, TIP also does a lot of work on this information in the Balkans, I would be interested to hear your perspective on this too. Yeah, uh, so um, it's a spot on question. Yes, it is. And um, it's uh, used as one of the instrument to d discredit uh, um, its statehood, you know, like it's a very good instrument to mobilize uh, actors, you know, like to to challenge further its uh, difficult trajectory of uh, uh, state building. So yes, it is, and we have also done studies on this, uh, and we are also underway doing other studies in terms of the sources of the disinformation campaign using the instrument of uh, radicalization or I would say exaggerating beyond the real figures. Uh, we see the, mainly the tablets in, in Belgrade uh, and uh, particularly Sputnik, uh, which is a Russian outlet uh, in Belgrade. There, are, there were very frequent uh, so-called analysis trying to uh, spread this information to the detriment of Kosovo uh, with the purpose of uh, with the purpose of portraying a situation which was uh, in uh, uh, sometimes in full discrepancy with with the reality. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I answered this on Istok. What Istok said? Well, uh, there are a number of uh, there there are certainly a huge number of immigrants from from Kosovo. Uh, we are talking about legal immigrants because they got a visa uh, to to work. Most of those uh, are. Uh, According to what we know, they are using Slovenia as a transit zone before they go to their end destination in Germany. Uh, so that they are staying in Slovenia just to uh, find it as a, as, a, as a provisional time before they, they leave to their end destination, which is Germany and Austria. Um, whether they could be a Bosnian-like model, uh, I think it's that's a prejudgment that this case just that because they have you know, some sort of background from, from a certain religion. But I, I, I wouldn't be worried. I think this is uh, up to Slovenia to integrate them. There are lots of successful cases of Kosovan uh, integration in the society. Um, I think there might be other more concerns uh, that are prevailing uh, elsewhere, like uh, I see uh, problems with democracy elsewhere, also in Slovenia in many respects. So we need to make priorities of which could be. Uh, still, there might be some individuals, but I would not tailor it uh, necessarily to the new wave of immigrants, because we also have lots of immigrants from former Yugoslavia that stayed in Slovenia, and uh, some of them are really a successful story. Yeah. Thank uh, you, Florian. Uh, we are basically practically out of time. However, I will take one last question and I'll ask, uh, ask each panelist to provide their perspective, because it, it really is an interesting question. From Novica, um, it says extremists and radicals need a, chal a channel to spread their ideas. 
How do you see the role of media in your country in the process of radicalization and, or de-radicalization? What have media done wrong so far? And what could they do to contribute to improving the situation? So from each of the panelists, um, quick uh, answer on that. And then very quick, maybe last concluding thought uh, to wrap it up. Start with whom? Dr. Mohammed, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. <laughs> A uh, quick answer, of course, there is a very important role to the media, but I think we have to note that the new generation, especially that the people uh, uh, whose uh, eyes is talking with most of them from the new generation, so that they depend on the social media more than the traditional uh, media. They deal with the Twitter, uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, and today Telegram. They depend on the Telegram, so that it's not easy to the traditional uh, media to deal with this uh, generation and to deal with the uh, propaganda of ISIS. Second uh, po uh, point here, I think that there are many faults happen between from the media in Jordan and Arabic world that they don't do their role in understanding the phenomena very deeply. They just want to condemn the phenomena more than understanding the root, the causes, the effects. So that I think that they, they, they have to do their role uh, uh, and to, to search uh, more objectively to understand the phenomena. Um, who would like to go next, Florian or uh, Isto? Yeah, I can. Sorry. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, so um, it's a very um, interesting question and I don't have, let's say, a, a clear answer because it's very complex. Why is it complex? I think Mohammed partially explained. This has to do because the traditional media is not to an extent that it used to be. So there is lots of social, uh, there are lots of things going on on the on the social media, and it's and it's basically out of uh, uh, our control to to deal with this. I know that the mainstream media was not. We are living in the world of click media, so the media does not. Most of the media now, and I'm talking from from this part of, of the region, it no longer cares about transmitting the good message. It cares about the clicks. So if, if there is a if there is a, a story, even a, let's say an extremist story, you know, like of, of murdering a case or a kid or whatever, uh, that is more important than trying to send a, a positive message. So um, whether you can, and it's the difficult thing is that in 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 like in a developing democracies like us, even if we, for instance, try to send the message and tell the certain media that don't try to. Uh, uh, you know, like uh, provide a different uh, uh, element to, to certain news. And there is this reaction of freedom of media, freedom of expression, and it's very difficult to handle with certain journalists, especially star journalists, uh, if you want to send a message for the purpose of public good. Uh, you can find uh, rare cases of, of journalists now, uh, at least in, in our context, that would first look at the public good, oh, let's try to do a uh, an article that would counter this narrative. They would just try to, to produce articles that would be quick and would trigger uh, attention. Yes, if I may continue. Uh, so as we know, media can be a very useful tool for all radicals. So it's very important how media report, how much space actually radicals and their ideas get and, and um, you know, and, and, and uh, under what uh, and how they're interpreted. So uh, media can be a tool and our journalists are pretty much aware of that. And I think they in Slovenia, they reported rather well about the Islamist uh, cases, the cases I talked about, except that they didn't, they reported on that, but they didn't, I think they didn't give sufficient weight to these events uh, because now looking backward, this really is serious. All these small events, taken together are very much serious. And uh, to, today, I think we have a journalist who asked this question just from, uh, he's from Slovenia and he's the one who reports on that. And I would like to thank him for the question. But I, I would also like to under, underscore the, the point about social media. We are now, especially in COVID time, we are facing a very interesting event. We, we are, uh, the, 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 the classic media have a competition from Facebook and Twitter experts who are getting uh, their voice heard uh, quite far. They are becoming influential, uh, very influential people, maybe as influential as some media, and uh, nobody controls that. Maybe we can control that with some legislation, uh, and companies, Twitter and Facebook actually also control that. 
uh, the, the most problematic thing is hate speech. What is exactly hate speech, hate speech, what is not? And in Slovenia, we are deep in this problem. We, we, we have a huge problem in terms of COVID polarization and radicalization. And I'm not sure if Slovenian media is doing a good job here. I, I mean, I don't know. The answer is I don't know. I, for the end, I would just, my concluding thought, uh, whatever happens on the field with radicals, there are, there are some, there is a battle uh, which is uh, taking place. Uh, there is a battle of ideas, which is probably more important or battle of narratives. Basically, in uh, democratic countries, we need to protect our idea of democracy. And our key challenge is, uh, in all events and in all interpretations and in all publications, key challenge is uh, people who don't believe in democracy, people who believe that we should, for example, live in the mono-ethnic country in the future, or people who believe that the anarchy is the future of our country, or people who believe that Sharia law should be applied, for example, in Slovenia. So this is basically more important uh, battle, battle, so to speak, uh, which is going on behind the curtains of uh, all physical expressions of uh, radicalism and even terrorism and polarization. Um, thank you very much, uh, Istok. I will leave it at that last thought, which I think is really uh, on point. Uh, I, we are Slovenian, so we're over time by seven minutes. I'm taking note of that. <laughs> we really do need to conclude, as we promised. This will be an hour's event. Uh, despite of the fact that we've touched on three somewhat different geographic locations and different threat levels, consequently, uh, I believe it's an issue that touches all of us, and it's a challenge that needs to be addressed uh, and I thank you all for being with us and for addressing this in your research, in your work. Uh, and we hope to host you next time as well and continue this extremely interesting discussion. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. And to everybody else, I wish a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.